how you doing? This is Adam Post, publisher of more than a thousand comic books. Today we're talking about um, Bob Chapik's disregard for fans and super fans of Disney, Marvel, all their brands. It's amazing to see him actually make comments like this. He didn't actually say F the fans, uh, but he really implied that he's not so interested in cultivating super fans of any of the Disney brands. Which is amazing because you would say in business, like your number one thing would be, hey, you know what I want to do is I want people to be really passionate, as passionate as I am about the things I'm creating, and then hopefully spread that to their friends and family, and that will be our core. And on top of that core, we can do anything. As long as we have the interest of those people, as long as they're telling us we're on the right track, we're going to have a successful group of brands in the future. We're set. That is not how Bob Chapek feels. <laughs> I do not know why. It doesn't really make any sense. And he also lacks media training. He, he lacks enough training because, you know, we've never really heard of Bob uh, Chapek before he became CEO of Disney. He did head up the theme parks. He's very capable. He's an executive. He knows what he's doing. But he just doesn't know how to handle, like, the high-level conversations and the high-level decisions. I you know, I, I don't know. I don't know how they're operating this way. Let's get into this first article. This gets right to the heart of it. There's so much more, but this gets right to the heart of it. This is from InsideTheMagic.net. Thanks to one of you guys who sent me this article. Really appreciate you. Um, and let's get into it. Before we do, please do subscribe to the channel. Click the bell for notifications. Give me a thumbs up when you like it. It really is a huge help, and you guys have been really great help with that lately. So Disney CEO Bob Chapek gives unpopular comments on superfans. Why would he do this? The Wall Street, you, wait till you see what, what do you see what he said? The Walt Disney Company CEO Bob Chapek recently gave some comments that may not sit well with many Disney superfans. Bob Chapek has been... The Walt Disney Company CEO Bob Chapek recently gave some comments that may not sit well with many Disney superfans. Bob Chapek has been the subject of much controversy among Disney fans for quite some time. Many Disney fans have blamed the CEO for the continued increase in prices at the theme parks, which of course it's him, as well as other issues like a seeming decrease in the maintenance at the parks and the introduction of controversial services like Disney Genie Plus and Lightning Lane. I mean, he knows the parks inside and out. If anything is happening at the parks, it's because he says so. That's it. That's just the business experience background. I'm just telling you, there's no way it's not him. Particularly because if uh, services were like substandard or something like that, and different from when he was running the parks, he would, uh, in a snap, he would fix that. But it's what he wants, so it's not getting changed. Still, Chapek has continued to lead the Walt Disney Company forward, and in the spirit of the D23 Expo, he gave an in-depth interview with Hollywood Reporter. That is right here, and it does have more than just this issue, so it is interesting to check out. However, when addressing Disney superfans, Chapek made some unpopular comments that might not sit well with those who visit Disney theme parks all the time and seemingly know all the hacks that come along with a trip to the Disneyland Resort or Walt Disney Resort. There are people that know how to take advantage a little bit of their uh, super fan, of their annual passes and being super fans and all that. There is no way that is creating any type of financial threat or significant damage to Disney. And it that should be looked at as, okay, if you know how to get around the corners a little bit and you know how to get this advantage or that advantage, um, you know, maybe we lose a little money on you if you visit too often, whatever. You know, it, it's obviously not killing Disney. It, it's not the part that's uh, making Disney suffer or have questionable business prospects. Those are the people who are invested in what you're doing. You should be rewarding them directly, not criticizing them. Quote from Chapek, we love all our fans equally. We love the super fans, obviously. But we also like the fans who don't have the same expression of their fandom. We want to make sure that our super fans who love to come with annual passes and use the parks as their personal playground, we love that. We celebrate that. 
But at the same time, we've got to make sure there's room in the park for the family from Denver that comes once every five years. We didn't have a reservation system and we didn't have control of the number of annual passes we distributed. And frankly, the annual pass as a value was so great that the people were literally coming all the time and the accessibility of the park was unlimited to them. And that family from Denver would get to the park and not be let in. That doesn't seem like a real balanced proposition. You know, the argument I would have about that um, right now is, have you ever, I haven't, heard of that being an issue where, oh my God, there are so many regular annual pass holders that are coming so frequently um, and that's really not making Disney accessible to, um, you know, new people that want to come. There's so much overcrowding. Sure, you've always, you know, been heard of waiting on lines forever. Uh, it's expected at popular theme parks. But this this sounds very uh, convenient to just, just blame the people that are going to the parks on a regular basis and spending money. There is no going to a theme park and not spending money. Chapek said he recognized that many super fans might see this as a disadvantage, but that's exactly what he felt like he needed to do to treat families who do not visit Disney. Okay, do not visit Disney. Chapek said he recognized that many super fans might not or might see this as a disadvantage, but it is exactly what he felt like he needed to do to treat families who do not visit Disney World often. Really? In all the years he ran the parks, this wasn't a problem. Now it's a problem? I mean, he's not even saying, well, since the pandemic caused an excess number of crowds, we're doing this temporarily just so we can kind of control uh, access to the park. None of that about, you know, reference to the pandemic. Is it possible that it's related to the pandemic? Sure, it's possible. 100%. But he's not even saying that. So no, it's not because of the pandemic. We've got to make sure that not only are we heeding the needs of our super fans, again, denigrating people, but we're heeding the needs of everyone who travels from across the country once a time every, okay, every five years. We have a real high class problem. We have much more demand than there is supply. We will not bend on, what we won't bend on is giving somebody a less than stellar experience in the parks because we jam too many people in there. You're <laughs> jamming too many people. If we're going to have that foundational rule, you have to start balancing who you let in. Uh huh. Our ticket prices and constraints, we put on how often people can come and when they come is a direct reflection of demand. That's why they have uh, smaller food portions, perhaps, people are complaining about at the parks. When it's too much, demand will tell us when it's too much. So basically, they'll just keep jacking up the prices and reducing benefits to super fans um, until demand drops off. That's what they're doing with um, trying to reduce inflation by raising interest rates. Basically, just make everything uh, destroy demand, basically. Get get demand out. Get the suit. <laughs> Is there's no concern for making sure that the super fans are satisfied. Doesn't that seem a little strange? Doesn't that remind you of things like, you know, when they make the changes on things like the Little Mermaid and like, well, we're getting a lot of bad feedback, but that's okay. You know, these changes to the Marvel movies, we're getting a lot of bad feedback, but that's okay. Why is it okay? Why? Why is it F the fans? We don't need the fans. It's, it's very strange, um, and maybe it's something to do with his uh, mentality from the theme park. I've been saying, and I, I, I guarantee you, he's been wanting to get aggressive with pricing at the theme parks for a very long time since he's been running the parks, and Iger or the board or someone held him back and was just like, listen, you can't forget the fans. You can't. But there's no one to stop this guy now. Now he's just on a roll. Now he's just going nuts and doing whatever he wants to do. Uh, and he also now needs the revenue because uh, the films aren't doing as well. And Disney Plus is doing okay, but it's not doing as well as they were hoping it would do. And they're now suggesting with Disney Plus, they have to raise the price on that as well. Raise the price on that as well. Same, raise, raise, raise. So where's what's the value proposition? It's like, well, we don't care. We don't care what value we're giving you. I'm annoyed with this. It, I've been to the Disney parks. It's not like it's... Um, you know, I'm looking forward to going back to Disney Park, especially now what they've been doing these last couple of years. Uh, but it's it's crazy to see their attitude 
with your intellectual properties is the same as the theme park. It's all part of the same thing. It's, hey, listen, we control this. You trusted us. We're in charge of the entire Marvel Universe. We're in charge of Star Wars. And Pixar was great. I always liked the movies. I, you know, I'm not like a Toy Story uh, fan or whatnot, but Pixar was unique in what they did. Um, and the Pixar studio is was an incredible thing. You know what Steve Jobs was able to do with it and their respect for storytelling. They got control of all of these brands and now they're they're blowing them off. It's it's amazing. It's amazing. And I, I I don't know why there isn't more criticism of it. Dan Loeb has been criticizing them, not directly on how they're handling their intellectual property. That's um, an outside investor activist done a couple of videos about that. Tell me what you think of this in the comments below. Do you see like, is there any regard for the fans or the super fans of the brands? This is from Hollywood Reporter. This is the full article. Disney's Bob Chapek on Scarlett Johansson's aftermath and but don't say gay impact, which is another thing that's inexcusably ridiculous, the way he handled that. The CEO also weighs in on whether it's possible to build a lasting franchise on streaming. And surprisingly, of course it's not a surprise, he's saying, oh yeah, sure, sure, you can build a brand on streaming because there's no marketing cost on streaming. So if they wanna introduce a new Marvel title on streaming, or they wanna keep putting out Star Wars branded titles on streaming, there's really no promotion and marketing costs for them. And they control how it's released, when it's released. They receive all the revenues for, uh, for it. And they also have all kinds of accounting tricks that they can play and say like, well, you know, we think this is going to be streaming and then in multiple outlets for 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, whatever they want to do. So they have a lot more control over any properties that are released to streaming. But as we've seen from other videos recently, the Star Wars toy brands, even the classic ones, are not doing as well because there are no new Star Wars movies. Who would buy Star Wars and not do new Star Wars movies? Uh, um, he's also, uh, they also discussed uh, fickle Wall Street demands. Quote, we knew that the frothiness of the streaming business was in the eyes of investors uh, and it would moderate at some point. Sure, you know all this stuff. And you know, that another thing about his leadership, you'll see here, he doesn't take responsibility for anything. Not even the Scarlett Johansson mess, which was ultimately going to have been his decision. And even frankly, if it wasn't under his uh, decision solely, the debate with Scarlett Johansson about releasing to streaming or releasing to theaters, you as a leader, if you are a leader, you take responsibility for things that aren't always completely your thing, but it's under your umbrella. He's not doing that either. It, I mean, for he's blaming the super fans <laughs> at the theme parks for why they have to raise prices. So no, he's not taking responsibility. All right. Um, it's important to go back to when Disney Plus was launched and that the hypothesis was about how much food you had to give that system for it to truly maximize its potential. And this is Chapek. I would say we dramatically underestimated the hungry beast and how much content it needed to be fed. As we were realizing that COVID hit, we were completely constrained in terms of making new things. You know, keep in mind, I, I have a lot of respect for uh, this guy, Kevin Meyer, who was a VP at Disney, who launched um, Disney Plus. I, I thought everything they were doing with Disney Plus was just brilliant. And, and that was before they were releasing, you know, uh, The Mandalorian even. And, um, but all of that took place in acquiring Marvel, acquiring um Lucasfilm acquiring Pixar, all of that was done before Bob Chapek got there. So your experience with Disney now is really the Bob Chapek experience. I, I, Iger might have gone in the same direction with a lot of stuff, the, the previous CEO, but I don't know how it could get much worse. So we had very precious few things that were trickling into our system and we had to make the very difficult decision where we put those things. When the theatrical world was shut down because of COVID, it was kind of an easy decision. You either postpone it for a couple of years and we started postponing as you remember, but we also had this sort of empty pipeline into this very important strategic initiative for the company, which was Disney Plus. Our viewers, our subscribers were asking for more. So we started, oh, now all of a sudden they're listening to viewers diverting content that was originally intended for theaters before Disney Plus was even envisioned, but to Disney Plus, diverting it to Disney Plus. 
But at that very same time, we started a very methodical plan to try to determine how much content we as a company would need to fully take advantage of the opportunities in theatrical because we love the theatrical business and how much we need to be able to feed the content pipes that were leading into Disney Plus so that we can embrace that opportunity. This was a weird time and I'll give him credit for that. You know, he didn't control the pandemic, uh, JPEG, and people were really not sure, are people gonna go back to movie theaters? You know, and they have, and there's been some massive successes in movie theaters. Um, but, you know, it's notable that the biggest Marvel-related title recently has been Spider-Man, which came out through Sony. So, yeah, they were involved in, in helping on the project, um, Marvel. But why can't Disney do another hit, uh, a really bigger-than-Spider-Man hit movie uh, for Marvel now that Chapex fully in control? Let me know what you think of that. Now the production is being fully, is back fully. We have a full understanding of what's needed, right? About now, this fall, we're in a position to fully program theatrical exhibition without having to steal content from one place or another, as well as our streaming services. Okay, now he's asked, do you think you can launch a franchise that turns into a theme park attraction on a streamer? Is there a film that has ever been made or a series that leads you to create an avatar uh, attraction? Where's the proof of that? Okay, he's saying absolutely they believe they can launch uh, a streamer title uh, or a series on a streamer and have that lead to a theme park attraction and become a massive hit. We've had titles in the past that frankly we put out in that theatrical exhibition um, like Encanto. It was a modest success theatrically and then we put it into Disney Plus and it shot up to number one. I don't have to tell you the phenomenon it became from a merchandise standpoint and from a music standpoint and how many more people saw it on Disney Plus. Yeah, but um, without the theatric exposure, people wouldn't have said, oh yeah, I've seen that movie. I never got a chance to see it in the theater. Let me look at it on Disney Plus. I think he's overselling it a lot. Okay, then they ask him again, do you think the theatrical component was essential or could you have done it without? I think there are films where the theatrical distribution is essential. I think with big blockbusters, there are titles that would be well advised to be launched theatrically and then go on to Disney+. Plus. But I don't think that's necessary for a franchise to be born. We have flexibility. This is a word I've used now since the beginning of the pandemic when I got this job. I, you know, what you should be doing is mentioning like Baby Yoda. Like Baby Yoda is an example of, well, I didn't exist before The Mandalorian. And yes, it was embedded in star inside the Star Wars franchise and people liked Mandalorian. So it's not its own property completely, but it, Baby Yoda was a phenomenon created on the streaming network. There's a lot of folks in the business, in the industry that want the world to go back to what it was and it's not because the consumer has moved on. Ultimately, everybody who's in this business caters to one entity and that's the consumer, but not the fans. The co <laughs> Unbelievable. How do you say that you're catering to the consumer if you're saying you don't like super fans and they're the problem? That, that the business moved on. That doesn't mean we're not gonna take great Marvel and Star Wars movies and Avatar, what Star Wars movie, and put them first in theatrical. We will because it's a wonderful way to expose those films and experience them. But what that does not mean that is that everything for it to be credible, for it to eventually turn into a Disney franchise has to go through that. Okay, you come to Wall Street saying, go all in on streaming, then Netflix hits this big bump and they pivot. How do you process this Wall Street short-term fickle thing? Thinking, this wasn't a short-term uh, fickle thinking at all. And of course, I'm gonna have a link to this um, in the description below for the full uh, article. Anything when he's talking about fandom, it's always terrible. Uh, all right, you're known as a guy who cuts costs and raises prices. That is true. You've raised the prices pretty stiffly for some streaming plans and the theme parks, and you've gotten some blowback from super fans. How much can you keep raising prices and does ill will from them create a problem for the brand? Okay, again, the quote is, we love all our fans equally. You know, anytime you have to say, we uh, love people and you have to say, oh, well, we love them. Why don't you tell them directly you love them? You love super fans, he should say, hey, if you're a Disney super fan, I love you. You know, and to all the Disney super fans that might be reading this, we absolutely love you. And but he doesn't say that. He talks about them. <laughs> but we also like the fans that don't have the same expression of their fandom. We want to make okay. Terrible. 
Terrible, terrible, terrible. And with respect to uh, his don't say gay uh, comments and, and his handling of that situation, you apologize to the staff on don't say gay. That issue caused you a lot of problems no matter what you did because you did everything wrong. Do you feel... <laughs> Do you feel that you've won back the staff's trust? As if all the staff felt the same way about it. All right, here's his, his weak response. There are complex social issues where we absolutely positively want to represent the needs and expectations of our cast members. All the employees are called cast members. But we also realize that sometimes in such a divided world, there's not alignment between what possibly large constituencies of our guests and consumer base are looking for in terms of the kind of content that they want to show their kids at this particular time. What we are trying to do is be everything to everybody. Really? That tends to be very difficult because we're the Walt Disney Company when you're a lightning rod for clicks and political podium speeches denigrating the opposition. It's just politics. The essence of our brand can be misappropriated or misused by you to try to fit the needs of any one particular group's agenda. We want to rise above that. We believe Disney is in a place where people can come together with shared values of what an optimistic and ideal future can be. We certainly don't want to get caught up in any political subterfuge, but at the same time, we also realize that we want to represent a brighter tomorrow for families of all types, regardless of how they define themselves. It's just not a good answer. And you know, he's had more than enough time uh, to come up with good answers for the whole dispute of the don't say gay issue. And their loss of control of their geographic district in Florida for Walt Disney World is an astronomical, uncalculable loss. That will cost them billions upon billions upon billions of dollars and he still has nobody happy. So that, that's your leadership over at uh, Disney. He's terrible. It's just a quick one. Um, Disney boss is rejecting Dan Loeb's call to spin off ESPN. But what's interesting about this is coming from the Financial Times, a great business site and a newspaper. Um, and what you get from this is this. He, he basically explains that um, they have a plan. Here it is. We have a plan for ESPN that will restore ESPN to its growth tra trajectory. ESPN has made Disney an absolute ton of money over the years, Chapek said. When the rest of the world knows what our plans are, they'll be as confident about that proposition as we are. Really? I don't think so. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, Loeb responded to Chapek's comments in a tweet on Sunday saying, Third Point has a better understanding of ESPN's potential as a standalone business and other vertical for Disney to reach global audience to generate ad and subscriber revenues. But he added that he looked forward to seeing ESPN chief Jimmy Pitaro execute on the growth and innovation plans, generating considerable synergies as part of the Walt Disney Company. In other words, he's saying that you can make all these promises and we regard that as uh, positive that you're at least thinking about what you're going to do with ESPN. But you need to execute. If you can't deliver on the results of ESPN, there's going to be a problem. In the interview, Chapek said he has regular conversations with Dan Loeb, which is interesting, that outside activist investor pushing for change at Disney, who also took a stake in Disney in 2020 and that he sold earlier this year. He characterized the conversations as very collaborative, non-antagonistic, and collegial. That's because of Loeb, because he knows that Chapek can't handle it. If Loeb gave him a hard time directly, he would just stop taking Loeb's calls, including around Loeb's recommendations to change the composition of the Disney board. They'll change one person, and Loeb probably wants like five people changed. Chapek defended the board, saying that the average tenure is four years and has a broad range of uh, skill sets. But he added, we're so consistent with Dan's thinking that everything he's talked about are either things we've considered in the past or are considering for the future. Loeb has also called on Disney to purchase Comcast's 33% stake in Hulu earlier than January 2024, when Disney has the option to purchase the remaining stake. Some analysts on Wall Street are also calling for Disney to settle the Hulu ownership soon because it limits, Comcast owns um, a third of Hulu and that limits what Disney can do with it because they have to kind of check with Comcast and deal with Comcast. There's accounting issues and things like that. Chapek said he would love to settle the matter sooner, but that Comcast has seemed reluctant. 
Quote, we've talked to them numerous times over the past year plus, he said. If that were in the cards, we would love to do that, but it takes two to tango. He noted that, the, you know who could have gotten that done, deal done? Iger could have gotten the deal done because he's Bob Iger. I mean, Iger was great at deal making. Can't say he wasn't. He paid too much for Fox, but at the time it looked like it made sense. And he got Marvel so cheap. He got Star Wars cheap. He got Pixar very, really plenty, not as cheap, but plenty cheap. His management of all the brands, it started to fall apart, but he got the deals cheaply at least. He noted that market sentiment has changed significantly since the agreement was struck when investors were more bullish on streaming. Yeah, so Comcast is just going to hold out to get as much money as they can. So I'm going to have a link to this article as well, and um, you can check out the full article there. And coming from Cosmic Book News, the Little Mermaid trailer disliked to oblivion on YouTube. YouTube is... Um, a little nuts, they got rid of their dislike button, but you can still dislike a video. And if you have the right extension on Chrome, see I have Chrome extensions here, you can actually see how many dislikes got connected. What's interesting about that is not everybody has these Chrome extensions to see uh, how many dislikes there are. So it's not like it's a feeding frenzy where everybody's like, oh, there's a lot of dislikes. Let me add more dislikes. Like, no, people just see it. They don't like it. They dislike it. What's Disney going to do about this? Uh, not a hell of a lot. Checking the official Walt Disney YouTube channel reveals 478,000 dislikes to 117,000 likes for the Little Mermaid trailer. That's a lot of dislikes. The IGN uh, trailer has 36,000 dislikes to 5.6 thousand likes. Rotten Tomatoes YouTube has 84,000 dislikes to 22,000 dislikes. That, that's, that's a lot of dislikes. That's a lot of people that are not so impressed with Disney's obvious race swappy stuff. Just like make a good movie and everybody's happy. But when you go switching around this stuff, nobody likes that. I mean, a few people do, but many more apparently dislike it, which is not good for momentum for the series. It has nothing to do with race. It just has to do with stop messing with classic brands. Nobody appreciates it. Respect the fans, Bob. Respect the fans. All right, let me know what you think of all this in the comments below. I really do appreciate it. Please do be sure to subscribe to the channel, click the bell for notifications, and give me a thumbs up when you like it. It really is a huge help. I'll see you again soon with another video, and if I don't see you, I will miss you.